Hi everyone, I'm Michael Hoffman. I'm a scientist at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto and assistant professor of medical biophysics and computer science there. So today I'm going to talk about gene regulation and, and motif analysis and what that means, I'll tell you in a minute. So at the end of today's module, you should understand challenges in predicting transcription factor binding, especially in predicting transcription factor binding from DNA sequence. You should be able to identify binding sites for known transcription factors, and you should be able to discover transcription factor binding motifs in genomic regions, such as those from chip seek peaks or promoters using iRegulon and Cytoscape. And that is what will happen in the second part of this morning. Uh, Veronique has prepared a, a lab that demonstrates some of the techniques shown here using a whiz-bang interface um, called iRegulon that uses some of the Cytoscape stuff you guys have learned earlier in this week. So there are a lot of different little parts here. Uh, we're going to learn about eukaryotic transcription. We're going to learn about several different computational uh, computational tools for predicting transcription factor binding, um, where they work, where they don't work, what's next in the field, and so on. So I'll start here with our introduction to eukaryotic description. All right. Here is a really oversimplified version of transcription in the eukaryote. So you have some DNA here. All right, and the first step is you have some transcription factor which recognizes some motif. The motif is in, in green here, so that green represents a transcription factor binding site. The transcription factor recruits RNA polymerase 2, and then RNA polymerase 2 comes along and produces RNA. So how much fun did I have? Not very much because I did it. I, I did it a few years ago, and then I lost the animation. So this is all me redoing something I did several years ago. So the second time was. It was not so fun. No, but but I will say this is this is the unveiling of the new animation. So for the past few years, I've had a note to myself: find animation. This guy's. You know, it's because I care about you guys so much. You actually get the real the real new animation. Um. <clears throat> So that's a very simple version. Uh, hey, show, who here, do you all work on eukaryotes? Are there any people here who mainly work on bacteria? Anyone? No? People work on, on yeast, metazoans, plants? Is everyone here an animal person? Now, yes. Now, yes? Any yeast people? Yeast people in the world. Yes? Okay. <laughs> it works. Francis is a yeast person. You know, this works kind of the same in yeast. Um, as I'm sure, you know, I've talked to a few of you guys, you know, most of you have some biology background, a few of you don't, but you probably know. It's actually a bit more complicated than this. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of other factors, and this is where things start to vary between yeast and humans and other, other animals and so on. A lot of other things that affect whether you have transcription or not. So, you know, here's a transcription start site. Not only will you be affected by, you know, some transcription factor binding site, there are also going to be lots of transcription factor binding sites. Um, just, you know, there will be transcription factor binding sites near the start of the gene, also distal from the gene. You have to figure out how those, those work out. Um, you know, there's splicing, alternative transcripts that can affect gene expression as well. That can even, f even affect... Um, gene transcription, um, even before things are separated off uh, pre-mRNAs. So there's a lot of complication. Uh, if you zoom out a bit, you can see it's even more compl complex than was shown in that previous previous model, right? because all of this is happening in, in 3D. So on the one hand, you know, it makes it easier to figure out actually how do these distal regions affect transcription. It's actually because they can be quite close in three dimensions, right? But figuring out how this works adds an additional level of complexity to modeling this, to taking measurements of it. And of course, all of this is in the context of chromatin, chromatin structure, 
Um, you know, so the DNA is wrapped around nucleosomes, the nucleosomes have different modifications of their own, and so on and so forth. So a lot of what people have been doing in the past few years in gene regulation is trying to understand not just this very simple model, but trying to understand the structure of DNA and chromatin at higher levels, being able to understand the other biomolecules that interact with DNA um, and contribute to transcription and other parts of gene regulation. So people have used a, a variety of techniques over the past two years that I will throw into the general category of functional genomics. All right, they include things like DNA-seq or FAIR-seq or nowadays attack seq so things people can use to figure out where regions of open chromatin are, right? And often a lot of the processes that I showed you in a much simpler model will only work if you're in a region of open chromatin to start with, right? People also have developed chip seq techniques that they can use to figure out both where individual transcription factors are bound along the genome and also where various histone modifications are. So the histones that make up the, the nucleosomes the DNA is wrapped around will have various covalent modifications that can be signals for different sorts of gene regulatory activity happening. All right, and so you can get RNA-seq and you can use that to get a map of where all of the, the genes are, but with all of this other data, you can also get maps of where all the regulatory elements are, both the nearby proximal regulatory elements and also the long-range regulatory elements, which are, which are far away. So there have been projects like ENCODE. ENCODE has, has collected uh, by now, there are more than 10,000 experiments that are deposited and freely available in ENCODE that will tell you various things about chromatin structure, various things about properties of, of chromatin in different human, mouse, and sometimes uh, fly and worm cell lines. Uh, and there's a lot of data available. So you get data from the ENCODE project, you can get some data from UCC Genome Browser, um, ensemble. There's a lot of data deposited in GEO as well, although often it's a lot easier to use these data if you go first to a uh, consortium website like the ENCODE website or the Roadmap Epigenomics Project website or, or, or so on. So there's a lot of data. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later on as to, to how you can use this to, to um, figure out the context of transcription within this much more complex model of transcriptional regulation. But first we'll go back to the very oversimplified version um, and figure out how we can predict using a computer um, exactly what is being transcribed. Any questions before I move on? All right. So in this next part, we're going to try to come up with models that will allow us to predict just based on sequence whether there is transcription factor binding, right? And then from that, a trans you know, a single transcription factor um, interacting with maybe other transcription factors can can bond, <coughs> sorry, can drive uh, transcription. But you know, often if you're trying to figure out what is actually the locus of regulatory control for a particular set of conditions, it's going to be a single transcription factor and it's binding. So here's one site of a transcription factor binding. So a transcription factor binding site, right? Single sequence of DNA. Unfortunately, this is the main complication, or maybe I shouldn't say it's the main complication. The first complication in uh, understanding which transcription factors bind is that they do not usually bind to an exact DNA sequence, right? Usually they can bind to a whole set of related sequences. So here's a set of binding sites for some transcription factor. And you can, if you're just eyeballing this, you can see there's a lot of similarity between these different binding sites. Like there's Usually a TT at the, the fourth position, you know, things are 
sort of mostly the same, but there's some differences from one place to another. There's some places that are more likely to change, other places that are less likely to change. So we need to be able to represent that if we want to characterize how transcription factor, what DNA a transcription factor binds to. Right? So here's one way to do that, is to use the, the IUPAC ambiguous DNA alphabet. So you've probably seen, uh, if you aren't familiar with the whole alphabet, which is sort of the province of, of geeks like myself, you've probably seen at least parts of it. You know, maybe you've seen R as a abbreviation for A and G, or Y as an abbreviation for, for C or T. There's a whole alphabet that will actually allow you to represent any combination of A, C, G, and T, right? Like this V here means A, C, or G, right? So you have A, C, or G here, and then you've got this, which is, um, you know, A, C, or T, and this R, which means A or G, um, and so on. Uh, and so that can represent all of the individual binding sites here combined into one sequence. Can anyone tell me something, you know, anything that might be missing in this, this description of these set of sites? The frequencies, yes, exactly. So, you know, you can say, all right, this position, this first position is never T, right? But if you, if you look at these, these here, yeah, it's never T, but most of the time it's actually A, right? So you've got more information in the fact that it's just never T. Right? So people have come up with a slightly more complex model um, to incorporate that information, and it's specifically, it's called a position frequency matrix. Right? So here, you can take this set of sites and represent it as a position frequency matrix, or PFM, and the matrix is just four rows, one for each uh, symbol in the alphabet, right? and a number of columns for for each column within these aligned binding sites, and you simply count up the number of times you see each one of these symbols and put it here in this matrix. Right? So you see A 14 times, C 3 times, G 4 times, T 0 times, and so on. And you repeat that for the rest, for the rest of the columns. <clears throat> so probably only a few of you have seen PFMs before, but I'm sure most of you have seen this sort of representation of a matrix that describes a motif, uh, which is called a sequence logo. All right, so this is the same thing as this. It's just a graphical version of this, essentially. All right, so every column, you have a set of symbols, and the height of the symbols indicates how frequent the symbol is in the position frequency matrix. Now, you can use a a sequence logo to represent a couple of different underlying matrices, and a PFM is just one of those, and we'll, we'll go on to some others in a second. Any questions here? Yes? Um, so, again, this, this model still doesn't cover for cases like, um, like dependency between different positions in the sequence? Mm -hmm. No, it, it doesn't. Is there, there is. Um, why don't you ask me about that at, at the end? Because we, we, we have to do more complex models that don't account for the interdependency between sequences before we can move on to things that, that might actually. Any other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so, I said there are a couple of different kinds of matrix. Actually, when people are, the, the software that people use to find transcription factor binding sites, we rarely use these raw position frequency matrix and matrices. Instead, people use something that is called a position weight matrix or a position specific scoring matrix, which usually I think of as, as synonymous things. And I'll explain how that works in a second. So let's start with a simple position fre frequency matrix, which we'll call F. All right, F is has four rows or bases, A, C, and G, and T, and it has five columns, and we'll call a, co a specific column I. All right, so this came from a um, set of sites. It may have come from ChIP-seq or Celex or various other, th various other things, um, and we got five sites at the end, and this is the position frequency matrix we got from counting up this 
this five wide motif in uh, five different sites. So what we do is we add various corrections. All right. So the first thing we will do is we will correct for nucleotide frequencies in the genome. So we'll divide anytime we have the frequency at a specific base and position, we will divide by the frequency of that base in the genome overall. Right. So this is something that will, this, this division will allow you to incorporate how surprised you are to see um, a particular base. Because if you said, if you say had some very AT rich genome, like maybe you had something with a GC ratio of 10%, so this genome is almost all a A's and T's, you are not going to be very surprised to see a motif that has a lot of A's, A's and T's in it. So you want to incorporate that surprisal into this somehow. Another thing that, that we're going to do is you can wait for how many samples you have going into your position frequency matrix. So if using the PFM formulation, right, if you have five sites here, uh, sorry, five, five sites where the first position is an A and there's zero everything else, that is considered equivalent to if you say had a hundred sites where the first position is is a and nothing else, right? But you know intuitively you know, that's not really that's not really true. Really, the more times you see something in your input data set, the more weight it's going to have, right? And what we do here in order to account for the fact that we have limited data coming in is we add what's called a pseudo count, right? So in this case we might take this, this PFM and we might add one to every position, right? So then this first column will be 6111, right? So that will keep us from having zeros in the matrix, which means you won't get a zero score if you ever see something that is, that is not A. Because when you have a limited set of, of input sequences, who's to say in the thousands of real sequences you'll see in nature that you aren't ever going to see an A there. It shouldn't be absolutely disqualified. On the other hand, by adding a fixed number one, right, that means that if you have a hundred or a thousand uh, sites coming in, um, it's going to affect the in positional weight matrix a lot less by just adding adding one than in the case where you had say five or, or ten sets coming in. And the final thing we're going to do is we are going to convert all of this to log scale probability so that we get very easy arithmetic. Um, you probably most of you probably think that computers are, are very fast at you know, doing any sort of basic arithmetic. But actually, computers are much better at adding than they are at multiplying. And if you can convert things to log space, and you're going to do a lot of calculations on them, it's a lot more convenient to have things in a way where you can just add up the numbers later on. It also reduces various sorts of numerical stability problems you might have. All right. So here's an example of a PWM that we got out of this PFM here. Right, and here's how we can use the PWM to score this particular uh, in sequence instance against this motif. All right, so TG, CTG, we just look at the corresponding row and column in the matrix. So the first, first uh, column is T, and we take the score there, minus 1.7, and we'll repeat that here, G, C, T, and G, and we just get all of these individual scores and we add them together and we get a final score of 0.9. All right. And if you want to convert that to the original probability space, you can exponentiate it, uh, but usually people don't bother. People just work in these, these log probability scores. Any questions about position weight matrices? Or as I mentioned, they're also called position specific scoring matrices. No? Okay. So let's extend, let's extend this here. Um, let's take a case where we have a motif that we've already defined somehow. So this is a SP1 motif. You can see the uh, sequence logo here. You can see a position weight matrix version 
of this logo here. And here is a sequence, and we are trying to score the whole sequence against this motif. All right, so right here we have, um, so, so we'll, we'll repeat this sort of process for every position within the sequence we're scanning, all right? So let's imagine we've gone into here and we score this sequence here against this motif, all right? So we got G, 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 so you add up what's here, G, 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 and so on, and you get what's called a an absolute score or raw score of 13.4. Right. So again, we want to go back to this question of how surprised we are to, to see this. And one way to do that is for us to look at what in this particular motif would be the maximum possible score for us to get. Right. So if we, we had something that had essentially what is the biggest letter at every every column here, and we sum those up, that would give us 15.2, and the minimum score is minus 10.3, and that gives us an indication of where this raw score fits in to all of the possible scores that you might get out of this particular motif. Right? We can simply calculate a relative score by taking the absolute score we calculated here minus the min score. Right, and dividing that by the full range of potential scores, maximum min scores, all right, and we get 0.93 or, or 93%. So this initially seems like a pretty, uh, pretty good match to this motif. It's 93% it's, uh, of what the biggest possible match is. Um, we like doing things with more of a, a p-value approach. So, um, you know, instead of just looking at that we might take the relative score and we might see where it appears amongst all of the different possible scores we'll see within our our genome of interest right and so the you know definition of a p-value is um, the probability that you get something of this score or greater under a null model right so the null model is that there is no enrichment for a particular motif here and you can simply divide the area to the right of the value over the area for the entire curve, and then you get some sort of p-value. So the closer you get over here to the max score, um, the smallest, the smaller your p-value is actually going to be. Any questions? All right, so if you do motif matching, this is this is often where the motif, the p-values are going to come from. So the other question we might have here in this, this previous experiment that I showed you is where does the motif come from? I mentioned that it might come from ChIP-seq or CLX experiments. Now there's some databases, and Jasper is the one I use most often, that has hundreds of different uh, sequence logos slash position weight matrices for, for different transcription factors that have been curated carefully and come from all sorts of, of different experiments. So you can use that if you ever want to, if you ever want to find individual motifs. Yes? Uh, how about the other database? Because I know like, for example, Transpark is, is commercial. I mean, it's commercial. You need like to have login like, details and everything, right? In order to get access to that data, and I guess you pay that one. Yeah. So is there like a, other databases that are rather complete and uh, curated that you can get free access to it and use? Uh, I don't really, okay, so the question was, well, the, so, so first the, the question mentioned TransFact, right? So, so there's another database called TransFact, and to get access to the full version of TransFact, you need to pay. Uh, so TransFact has uh, many more motifs in it than, than Jasper. Um, my um, impression from looking at TransFact is that they have slightly lower um, stringency in deciding what sorts of results will go into TransFact. So usually I want more high, high confidence stuff so I don't really you know, worry about not having TransFact in, in, in my analyses. So the, the question was really, uh, are there any other databases that, 
you know, compare to Jasper or Transfac. And I am not really aware of any, um, you know, there's not really, there's not really any incentive for anyone to create something like that because we already have Transfac on the commercial side and Jasper on the, the free side. So anyone who wanted to do something like that would hopefully participate in Jasper instead of trying to roll their own thing. <coughs> any other questions? Yeah, I, there's, a, you know, so there's some, um, I've been doing this for a lot longer than, than it may seem, because I think I look younger than I am, or at least I hope I still do. Um, <laughs> you know, and you see these sorts of things uh, come and go, and there are various, you know, there have always been various commercial uh, approaches to, uh, various problems in bioinformatics, whether it be methodological or, or data or so on. And what I've seen time and time again um, is at one point these things look better um, and at some point a few years later they are surpassed by something that is uh, sometimes completely different and also usually free. All right. So I've, I, I have learned my own personal bias from uh, my experience is to think of some of these commercial things as kind of a, a dead end, right? Because often you don't have a good idea of, you know, exactly what is going into uh, the product or, you know, what people are going to do to continue to build it up over the years and to keep innovating it and so on. So it's, it's, it's something I, I avoid and I haven't, I haven't felt like I've missed out yet, but you know, who knows, like I said, that's my own, my own bias and we'll, we'll see what happens over the next few years. All right. So moving on to the, the next step here, which is those motifs that we have in databases like Jasper and Transfac, both the commercial and non-commercial version. Where do they come from, right? So I, I mentioned there are experiments, there are things like um, CLEX, there are things like protein binding microarrays, uh, which you know maybe in a, a future version of this talk I should I should have a uh, an overview of those sorts of things. Um, but in the end, what you get out of those is a list of sequences, and somehow you have to convert this list of sequences to a position weight matrix. Um, and you also have to um, <clears throat> contend with the problem that the sequences do not come to you nice and aligned with everything, you know, everything matching up at a particular, particular column. All right, so that brings us to what is called the motif discovery problem. So, you know, if you have three sets of sequences, and let's say you know, and they're long sequences, so hundreds of base pairs long in this case, you know or suspect that there is some sort of short motif that is in common between the, the three of them, how do you find that, find those motifs? Right? And it's not as easy as, say, doing a sequence alignment of, of these against each other, because as you remember, the motif is degenerate, it's not, you aren't going to find exact matches between the different sequences. All right, so given this, this, these sets of sequences, we want to find a number of motifs. Uh, we don't necessarily know the width of each motif, uh, of the motif starting out, and we don't know where they are. Uh, this, is, this is hard, not only are these things degenerate, the motifs are actually fairly short and the sequences can be fairly long. So I'll give you a little example here of, of how someone might might do this. Let's say we're given a set of promoters from genes that we suspect are co-regulated, but we don't actually know what sort of uh, molecular process is driving the co-regulation. Right, so here are a set of, of genes here. Here are um, 
you know, a few dozen base pairs upstream of the transcription start site, which we will call the promoter. We suspect, where we hypothesize that a transcription factor binds the, the set of sequences in common, uh, but we have to remember one other problem that wasn't disclosed before is that the transcription factor, you know, it doesn't have our, our notion of, of strand either. It could, it could bind to either strand. So sometimes you'll find, say, AAGA, GTCA here, or sometimes you'll find the reverse complement of that, TGA, CTC, and so on. All right. We'll assume that we can describe the, the binding motif with the position weight matrix, and we want to find these sites. So the way people, people usually do this, and this is an approach we use quite often in trying to find um, parameters for a, a model we have given a set of input data is, is a so-called alternating approach. Right? So you know, we use this here in, um, in discovering motifs. Um, I also use an alternating approach in an entirely different area of, of science where I'm trying to model different sorts of chromatin states that will occur throughout the genome. It's a, it's a way people often, often use to find parameters. So what we do here is we somehow come up with an initial set of parameters or initial weight matrix here. Right? Um, so you can come up with this completely randomly, you can come up with it with some sort of um, initial guessing algorithm. And then we'll use that initial version to predict instances across the sequences that we have. Right? And then we'll use whatever we found to slightly refine what we started with and we'll repeat this process. Right? And various versions of this alternating process will give us a guarantee that from some position we will find a local maximum. Now notice I didn't say global maximum, right? So that's the main problem with these sorts of alternating approaches is it often relies a lot on what your initial, initial value is. So there are various approaches to that. Uh, one approach is just to make sure you try a lot of different initial values so you don't get stuck in some sort of um, local maximum, but, but, you know, something that is not near the, the global maximum. So I'll make this a little bit more concrete here and show one example of a alternating method, which is called the Gibbs sampler. Um, there are other methods uh, like expectation maximization that are kind of similar in concept, but, but slightly more complex to explain. So I'll show you how a Gibbs sampler for finding uh, for finding motifs works here. So in this particular Gibbs sampler, instead of just say randomly initializing the matrix altogether, we are going to pick random subsequences from each one of these sequences. All right, so just totally random. We don't we don't actually know whether they they match up very well or not. And we take those and we'll pick one of the subsequences at random and exclude them. So here we took out number four, and that I'll show you why in a second. We take these other four and we calculate a position frequency matrix, which we then turn into a position weight matrix using the way I showed you before, which thankfully is all in your, your little notebook if you if you can't remember the fine details of that. But the point is we you know take this and we exactly get a position weight matrix. All right. Then using that. In the excluded sequence four, we are going to score this entire sequence. All right. So using this matrix, we are going to get scores at every position here. So here's a position here that matches that position frequent position weight matrix pretty well. Um, there are some positions here that match it a little less well, and some positions that don't match it at all. All right. If we Take the scores we have here, you get essentially a 52% chance that there's a match to this sequence right here in this biggest peak here. But we aren't going to immediately go to what has the highest magnitude because that's definitely a recipe for going to something that is a 
local optimum and even in the nearby neighborhood is, is kind of a pessimum. Instead, we are going to use this as a weight for, um, for picking something probabilistically. And in this case, even though this only had 20% of the weight, you know, we got that lucky one in five where the algorithm has picked this sequence right here and then we have taken this sequence that we've picked and put it into our set of sequences and then we we'll repeat the whole thing, right? So then, not in the initialization step, but we we'll repeat the, the rest of steps two and three. So we will then throw away a different sequence here and repeat that whole scoring and and picking using a uh, weighted probability process and repeat that down the line, right? Um, and then we are going to, you know, repeat this whole process a bunch of times, and then we will find whatever motif has the the highest score for this set of sequences, and that is our motif. So that's how it works. It's I'm not sure if it's magic or not. So if you, if <laughs> some some days it it, it feel it certainly feels magic that that something like this would actually actually work, um, but um, because it's not, it's not possible to actually exhaustively go through every every possible motif that ma might match these sequences. But if you start with enough uh, initial values, you will um, get a value that is at the end that is often pretty close to what might have been the optimal possible value. And people have determined that using various simulations. Any questions about this? Yes. Do you have a cutoff for the highest motif, highest motif score? That is one way you could do this. You could say, I'm only going to, to so there were you know, various stopping rules, right? I would probably say, I'm going to repeat this process 10,000 times and, and take the best. You might take a uh, process via which you say, I'm going to repeat doing this until you know, I have a motif over a certain score. Um, and if there actually is a motif here that has that, that particular score, then <coughs> you'll find it eventually. Um, but I, I, I would usually go to something where you instead you know, pick a certain number of, of uh, initial random values you're going to pick from the start. Do you uh, use green your search space? Do it. Yeah, I mean, so. Um, you know, to start with, like this particular um, process, this particular example here, we started with a set of, of potentially co-regulated genes. So, you know, we may have started with 500 base pairs upstream of all of these genes, or you can do 2,000 base pairs or, or whatever. Um, this process becomes very expensive and very slow very quickly, um, even even in in 2017. So people try to pick fairly fairly short sequences. Um, you know, for the motif discovery problem, I think it's it's still not really tractable to do it genome wide. Although you, after you've identified motifs, you can certainly scan genome wide for a motif you already know about fairly easily. Good question. Is the motif fixed? Length. Oh, length fixed. Okay. So in this particular instantiation of the problem, you know, this this if, or or solution, this essentially has a fixed width, right? So if you don't know the width ahead of time, then you essentially have to to try a number of different widths and see uh, which which motif scores better, and that gives you a variety of different problems. <laughs> Um, people don't incorporate sort of a, once you have a solution and say like a seven murder motif, they don't try a grow or shrink to see if that improves or decreases the motif. There definitely are approaches people have, have tried that will do that sort of extension. Yeah. Um, this this simplif simplest version here here doesn't, but I've seen seen versions where people try that. Yes? Um, so, 
Oh, the question was, how quickly does this work in practice? So when I've done this sort of thing, it's usually been with the, the meme chip pipeline, uh, which is de designed for doing this, this sort of thing on, um, on chip, chip seek peaks. Um, and so for that, you might have you know, a few thousand peaks of where you have sequences of a couple hundred base pairs. Right, and that sort of thing will take an hour or two. Um, How many iterations is that? I'm not sure. And it uses it doesn't use a Gibb sampler. It uses uh, Meme, which should give you the same answer every time based based on the way they so so they use an alternating approach, but they formulate it slightly slightly differently. Um, so. You know, one of the things about meme chip is it does restrict you to having a couple hundred base pairs of your for your search window, and that's often what's going to be the thing that increases the complexity of this the most. If you used instead, you know, a few thousand base pairs as your your search window, it would take quite a bit longer. All right, so let's say you have this, you have a motif. Now, what do you do with it? Well. The first thing I would do with any motif that I discover de novo is I would use a tool called TomTom. This is this is part of the meme suite, and so TomTom can compare against compare your motif against everything in Jasper. If you have Transfac, you can you can do that as well. And it'll tell you how how well your motif matched against those those sequences. So this is a good thing to do if you think that you may have a, a new motif, you know, you can also start by searching um, against something like, like, you know, you can, you can start by using something like FEMO to just search against what's in uh, Jasper already, although sometimes you'll find that in individual sequences um, there might be slight changes, you know, there might be a difference between a motif that you discovered using an in vitro method like protein binding microarrays versus a motif that you discover using your particular set of chip seq data and your particular, your particular system of interest. So, this model, let's talk about how good it is. So, in 1997, Tronch and colleagues tested 50 predicted transcription factor binding sites using an in vitro binding, binding test and found that methods, sorry, found that sites predicted using methods very similar to what I've shown you here, 96% uh, of them were bound. Right? And there was some work by, by Gary Stormo um, where he found that the best position weight matrices actually, we, even though it's defined usually using information theory, it recapitulates what's going on biophysically um, and that you can often have, you know, essentially additive effects by, by column in a, you know, in the biophysical model in a way that's very similar to what's going on in the information theoretic version of this model. So that's good. It's bad is that if you look at one of these transcription factor binding, seat, binding site motifs and you just try to predict where the binding sites occur across the, the whole genome, uh, you will find a lot, a lot of them, right? <coughs> like, and here's a particularly bad example. So if you use a whole set of profiles from something like an early version of Jasper and you predict binding sites across a gene, you are going to find lots and lots of places where some transcription factor binding site or another might bind. You know, really the whole whole gene here. Um, so even though people have shown that this model really works quite well in vitro, um, in vivo these, these predictions that you make based with sequence alone are almost always wrong. Um, so Y.F. Wasserman has called this the futility conjecture uh, you can come up with, you know, these wonderful models to do this this sort of thing, and you know, in terms of actually helping you 
predict in the end which transcription factor binding sites, which transcription factors are going to bind to a sequence of DNA. It doesn't really help you. Um, so with this knowledge, what might you do to improve your predictions? Any suggestions? Yes. Integrate like six data, so you know that the, 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 which one of these motifs are actually bound by transcription. Well, then why are you doing prediction? That's really cheating. It's like you know, <laughs> like you know, let's let's uh, you know. Avoid avoid predicting by using a gold standard measurement instead. I mean, I like the way you think. I mean, that's that's you know, in some ways that's a really good answer, but in other ways, you know, uh, sometimes you can't do chip chip seek, right? It can be. Uh, chip what's that? Without chip seek, so we have this restriction. Okay. Yeah. Good. So other other suggestions? Yes. Integrate dependency between positions. And <laughs> integrate position integrate dependency between positions stop assuming the <clears throat> positions are independent um, I mean you you could do that I think I think that will you know maybe increase in vitro increase something like this 96 percent to 98 percent right uh, but in the end you're still gonna have stuff like this right? So any other other suggestions? Like you want to reduce the number of false positive rates, false positives. How do you how do you do that? Yes. You can just use a technique to find regions of bound, unbound chromatin in general. Like look for a whole genome both of them. But you could also so, score combinations of motifs that occur less frequently. That that is true. That is definitely something you could do. Okay. Well, you guys are obviously way too sophisticated because the 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 really simple answer to if you if you have some sort of method for scoring things and you want to decrease the number of false positives, there's a really easy way to do it. What's that? You pick the top ones, right? You 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 know you have some sort of threshold and you increase the threshold so that you uh, you know only get ones that are above a, a higher threshold right so after I've rated you guys into giving me that answer that's not the right answer that's not gonna work uh, but I think it's important to say say why that works so actually if you you know if you make the more more stringent threshold that doesn't actually help things very much because it's not actually you know, poor fit to this model um, in terms of the actual s local sequence that's keeping us from having um, you know, predictions that match with reality here. It is actually other effects. Uh, I think Brian's answer, answer there is actually a very good answer. If you can incorporate information about uh, you know, where are actually regions of open chromatin, that's actually going to help you the most. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. All right, so what have we learned in this, in, in this part? So first, these models are very, very good for defining what's happening in vitro, right? In certain cases in, in vivo, I think they're going to be a very good model of what's going on as well. But there's other information that you need to, to determine uh, <clears throat> whether this is a this this is a place within the genome where this is a good match. All right. So a little bit later on into into this lecture, we'll get into some of those those ways that you can use additional information. But for now, I want to talk about something a little bit more more practical, which is you know, let's say you have that very problem that I presented before, which is you have a set of co-expressed uh, genes and you want to figure out what's driving their regulation. And you actually are not really interested in discovering a mo new motif or writing your own Gibbs sampler. Uh, you just want to figure out, you know, what, you just want a good hypothesis as to what might be driving this, this co-expression, right? So let's say you have a set of co-expressed genes, all right, and you got this from some RNA-seq data or microarray data or something, all right, you have a set of, of genes that you know are not actually co-expressed in these same, same sorts of conditions. Um, either they, you know, aren't 
you know, they constantly aren't expressed under these, say, two conditions you're looking at, or they constantly are expressed, and so on. All right. <clears throat> Can you figure out what motif is driving the co-expression? Right. So here we'll have an example of one motif, and you find that motif in various places in the co-expressed <coughs> genes, maybe once in upstream of this gene and a few times upstream of these genes, and you find it never in the negative controls. So if you know this is happening, this is actually a pretty good indication that this, this motif might be responsible and certainly worth looking into further. All right. <clears throat> How do you do this? Um, there are a variety of different tools. We are going to show you a tool called Iregulon, which will solve some of this problem. Uh, later this morning, so Baron Equal will lead a, a lab that shows how you can look at a bunch of genes that you think might be co-regulated. And Iregulon is a plugin for Cytoscape. So you can get your set of co-regulated genes from something else in a Cytoscape workflow and then try to, to find whether there are motifs that are up, upstream. You know, it will also incorporate actual chip seek information, so you don't have to rely just on the motifs if you have have something more, uh, and so on. And there are various other other tools that can do this sort of thing. Um, you know, there are tools within the meme suite. There are tools like Opossum, uh, but we're going to show you Iregulon because it hooks into Cytoscape, and we've already spent some time working on that. Um, Another problem that we have, and this is a, this is a problem that even goes beyond um, you know what you can address by finding regions of the chromatin, is that there are sometimes um, transcription factors. There are sometimes families of transcription factors that will bind very similar sequences. Uh, for example, the <coughs> ETS family. Um, or the GATA family, you know, GATA 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it's very challenging to figure out whether a particular motif is GATA 1 or GATA 3 because you've got the GATA in, in either, either case. Um, so, you know, here's an example of, you know, the ETS family, lots of different genes. How do you find which one? Um, there is software called Top Gene um, that will help you do that sort of thing. So if you ever find yourself in that sort of problem, that's one way to do it. Another way, you know, something we've been working on in my lab is, you, you know, trying to find differential models between different uh, transcription factors, like in the GATA family, by, by developing models using knockout data, right? So you can come up with a better motif for something like GATA3 um, if you collect chip-seq data in cases where you have got a three knocked out or not, or maybe you've got a one, two, and four knocked out, and, and so on and so forth. So it helps you refine these sorts of differences that are otherwise hard to find in vitro. All right, any, any other questions on any of this stuff? All right, so we'll move on to the last part of this lecture, which is incorporating information about the biochemistry of gene regulation. So all this wonderful data from things like in code that I showed you at the, the beginning. Um, you know, how can you incorporate this sort of information and limit your, your search space if you're going to look for regions where a transcription factor might be bound. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can use annotations from tools like Segway. Segway is, is a computational method from my lab, which will take lots of different kinds of data from ENCODE. So ENCODE for some cell type, they've generated chip-seq data on lots of different histone modifications, open chromatin data, things like PAL2, things like CTCF. Right? Segway is something that does unsupervised pattern discovery and figures out you know, what sort of patterns you find across multiple data sets at various position, positions, and then turns that into a annotation that is cell type specific. I'll tell you where the starts of genes are, or the enhancers are, or, or repressed regions of the genome are. Right? And then you can visualize what was here, maybe 30 different tracks, 30 different data sets that each have you know, different patterns like this. Instead, you can turn it into this much more digital pattern where you say, okay, this 
looks like a gene start and you know this looks like a repressed region and and so on uh, and you know that makes it easier to interpret things so here's an example of interpretation <coughs> from a GWAS we're trying to figure out you know which single nucleotide variants at issue are in various categories outlined by Segway you can also do this in uh, trying to understand where <coughs> transcription factor binding motifs work right so if you are scanning for places where your particular transcription factor might be binding, you probably don't want to scan the things that you already know are quiescent in your cell type. Instead, maybe you want to focus on the enhancers. Maybe you want to focus on the things where there are epigenomic signals that they look like promoters. Or you want to focus on regions where you know there's open chromatin and, and, and so on. All right. So Segway will will get you that. This, here's another representation of the Segway data where it says, you know, this region right here is regulatory. Um, these regions are TSS flanking. And even though we have this information from gen code where we can, you know, see that there's a bidirectional promoter here, Segway doesn't actually incorporate that information into its analysis, right? So it's it's much less biased towards what people already know. So you can find regulatory regions like this in plenty of places where there aren't actually transcription start sites um, annotated. Also, you know, the problem before of, you know, what's the promoter? Well, we'll just take the TSS and go 2,000 base pairs upstream. Now you don't actually have to do that anymore. If you have epigenomic data for your cell type, you can, you know, then actually see which regions look like they have have promoter activity and, and focus there. So you can go to Segway at segway.hoffmanlab.org if you want to look at the annotations. You can click here. Um, you know, it'll load into the UCSC genome browser, and you can see here yet another representation of Segway data where we have uh, you know more than a dozen different cell types here, right? And then uh, colors represent different sorts of um, segue categories, right? So this is the, is it the yeah, um, alpha globin locus, right? So here's HBA, right? And you can find here this region seems to be uh, have repressed transcription activity in most of these different cell types, with the exception of here's H1 embryonic stem cells, where there seems to be some expression. There seems to be some transcriptional activity at the uh, alpha globin locus, and then K562, which is a blood lineage uh, cancer cell line where the whole region is is lit up like a fireworks display. It's very very active all through this, which is what we would expect. You know, hemoglobin very active in the uh, blood precursors or cancerous versions of blood precursors and so on. Yes. Can we suppose that you want to do this on a new cell line, so you cannot use like the encoded data to do that. And your favorite cell line, and you have tons of chips and things like that, which is like the minimum. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, you know, what, you know. This is great. Well, this is great. Isn't wasn't part of the question, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is great for you know those locations, those cell types where you already have a bunch of data and someone's already done this for you. You know, what if you don't have any any data like that? So I would say you know, and and what should you collect? Right? What sort of experiments would be best? I think the single best thing you can do is collect open open chromatin data. Right? So if you can do attack seek on your cell type or um, you know organism of interest um, that is the single best thing you can do and and uh, although I no longer do wet lab experiments myself I'm told that attack seek protocol is fairly straightforward and people have a fairly easy time doing it sorry what's that uh, it's hard to. I'm not. I'm not really sure. I mean, it's relatively small proportion. I mean, I, you know, I would estimate something like you know, ten percent of the genome is near an open chromatin region in in some particular cell type, right? But it changes from cell type to cell type, right? So if you if you add up 
you know, all of the different cell types in some organism, like say the encode did. You might find that say, you know, 50% of the genomes consistently open chromatin in some cell type or another. These are all rough estimates, even though I know I'm being recorded and put on the internet. Please don't, please don't <laughs> quote me on this, this sort of thing. Um, so, you know, if you can get open chromatin data, that's, that's great. You won't need anything like Segway. If you want to do a little bit more, you know, doing histone modification, chip seek is the, the next thing that I would do. And, you know, uh, for something like Segway, I think it's useful as soon as you have two different data sets you want to integrate. If, you're just, if you just have one data set, uh, then you're probably better just be calling that one data set. But if you, you, know, you want to add things like H3K27 acetylation, H3K27 ME3, H3K4 ME1, H3K4 ME3, H3K36 ME3, that would be, that would be kind of the starting set I would start with. Um, and a lot of this depends on how much you can you can afford. The nice thing about histone modification chip seek is it's often a little easier to do than than the transcription factor chip seek. The antibodies are more established, um, and yeah, what's that? They are better. They are they are better. Yeah. Um, so it's you know more within the realm of possibility to do that than certainly to do. Uh, chip seek for every transcription factor you might be interested in. RNA seek can be incorporated. So, in something like Segway, I actually have a grad student who's working on an RNA seq version of Segway, which is called Seg RNA. Uh, so, you know, one thing to consider with all of these chromatin data sets, it's not really stranded, right? So, you know, if you have a region of open chromatin, it's, it's open chromatin on the plus strand and the minus strand. Uh, but if you want to incorporate RNA type data, you need a slightly more complex model. Any other questions on this chromatin stuff or encode? Whatever. So another, another tool that might be of interest to people, and this is not strictly speaking motif analysis, but you know, if you have some regions of, of interest and you want to figure out, you know, what sort of biological process or molecular function ties them together, uh, you can use a tool like, like GREAT. Um, so this allows you to do the same sort of, you know, it's very much like gene set enrichment analysis, except instead it's genomic region uh, enrichment analysis. So GREAT has a um, you know, slightly more sophisticated approach to take a bunch of regions that you got from something like an enhancer assay or, or chip seek data or, or looking for ultra conserved regions across organisms. Um, and it will map the annotations given to individual genes to entire nearby, nearby regions, right? And it will, you know, tell you how close these regions are to TSSs, and it'll give you a set of uh, gene ontology terms, or it can also get from other sorts of annotations like pathway commons, right? So you can see that whatever data set was given here gives you things that are related to the immune system and so on. So one other thing that, that I think is should be of interest is, you know, uh, even beyond finding regions of of open chromatin, one big part of the puzzle in mechanistic models of transcription factors binding to, to sequence is transcription factors often work together, right? Um, so it's often not just one transcription factor that binds a particular position. Often there, there are pairs of transcription factors that work together. Sometimes there are transcription factors that compete with each other. But in the cooperative case, um, what you can do is look for a couple of different transcription factors that you find consistently near each other, maybe with some consistent spacing between them, all right? And you can imagine how this might work within the nucleus. If you have some transcription factor here, right, and it has some sort of rigid interaction with another protein here, you're going to find that these mo these two motifs are always going to have a very similar spacing between them because it's defined by the physical interactions between these two transcription factors. 
So there's a tool in the meme suite designed for this particular problem, which is called Spamo, and it will take some sequences and you know data from sorry and and motifs from something like Jasper or your Uniprobe, right, and it will tell you how close um, you find one transcription factor's motif to another, um, and it's a good thing to look for if you want to, you know, find any of these telltale, like, we always find this motif exactly 11 base pairs away from this other motif. Sometimes you find it, sometimes you don't. Yes? So, so for example, if you have the question of, like, a, a set of genes, and the promoters of these genes, you, the hypothesis is that two or three transcription factors preferentially bind the promoters of these genes compared to, to anything else in the genome. Is this the approach, or you would do something like hypergenetic test based on the genes of the or something like that? I mean, I think, so the question is, you know, should you start with the hypothesis that your co-regulated genes are uh, regulated by a couple of different uh, tran transcription factors? I, I think it's a good thing to, to look at, right? Um, you know, so you could use, like, you know, if you have a set of genes and you're trying to make sense out of it, why not use all of the different tools at your disposal? Like, you certainly can do things like gene set enrichment analysis, right? Uh, which almost by definition is not going to tell you anything new about any of these individual genes because it relies on annotations that someone had to curate for all of these individual individual genes, right? Um, so the nice thing about taking, say, a sequence motif discovery or identification approach is you might find in this set of genes there's there's some motif that you know maybe no one has has found before, and it might be the sort of thing where because of the futility conjecture, you know, you can find any individual. You can find any individual motif in the promoter region of any particular gene, so someone might not have noticed that it is enriched except in the set of co-regulated genes that you have. That might be the first time you have the statistical power to actually detect any sort of meaningful um, enrichment of this particular motif. So, you should do it all, in my opinion. Other, yes, question in the back. How would you approach So chromatin modifiers like HDAX and HATS or like yeah, yeah. Targeting, um, okay. as opposed to specific So the question was if you have some chromatin regulator you're interested in and you want to figure out what what transcription factors it might be interacting with, what's the best best way to do it? Um, so I, you need some sort of data on the on the chromatin regulators or the chromatin modifiers to start with, right? So, um, you know, if you were to do this in a, a genomic way, you know, you would you would need something like um, chip seek on your your chromatin regulator, right? So you could do chip seek on your chromatin regulator, um, and then you could look for motifs within the the regions that you chipped. So you could use something like meme chip, right? Um, and you might discover a motif, and the motif is probably not going to be a motif for your chromatin regulator. It'll be a motif for something that your some transcription factor that your chromatin regulator interacts with. So that's that's what I would do here. I mean, of course, you know, you could also take other, you could take proteomic approaches as well. If you did something like, um, oh, what is that technique called? I have all these colleagues who do this this uh, this biotin associated technique. Uh, I remember what this this calls it. This is called it uses something called BRA to. Um, you know, produce, you know it? Yeah. But there's some sort of name for using this in, in proteome. Yes? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you can, you know, use a proteomic technique to kind of figure out different proteins that interact with some bait you have of interest, like your chromatin regulator. What's that? Yeah. Um, so you could do that as well. But, you know, if you wanted to do it based on genomic data, I would, I would think, you know, doing chip seek of your chromatin regulator uh, plus mean chip would be the, the way to go. And then, you know, after you identify those motifs, that would make it much easier to do sort of targeted um, validation ex uh, experiments for your hypothesis that the transcription factor, ex you know, that binds to the motif you discovered is interacting with your chromatin regulator, which I would want to do before submitting something like this for, for publication. Other questions? All right, so, yes? You use these tools to look for repressors too. Yes, you certainly can. If, you're, if your repressor has a, um, you know, if your, your repressor has a well-defined motif, then it works just fine. If your repressor interacts with a transcription factor that has a well-defined motif, it will work just as well. Right. So to you know, some extent, these methods, you know, they aren't going to distinguish in vivo. They aren't going to distinguish between you know something that primarily interacts with the sequence and something that interacts by virtue of the same transcription factor every time. All right. So I've shown you some of the the state of the art. Um, you know, big challenges that are ahead. One is that the action of transcription factors is very cell type specific. You know, things like uh, ENCODE have gotten us more data on individual cell types. If we want to understand how transcription factors control development, we are going to need a lot more data on, on, on stuff like that. We are going to need models of how individual transcription factors start to become expressed in individual cell types and how that leads to a cascade of other transcription factors um, engaging in, in transcription initiation. Um, genetic variation in transcription factor binding sites is a topic of, of interest to people, you know, especially now that people are starting to tap out more of the uh, genetic diseases that are caused by changes in protein coding sequence. All right, there's a lot of disease that is probably caused by variation in non-coding sequence that acts by virtue of um, you know causing some transcription factor to bind at a position or not. People are developing methods that that try to predict how different uh, variants will affect transcription factor binding sites, both in, in genetic diseases and also in different kinds of cancer, because it can also be something that drives different, uh, different gene expression programs there as well. Integration of data sources like ENCODE or roadmap epigenomics, you know, we still need to develop more. Um, you know, a lot of these methods were developed before we had those sorts of those sorts of data. And while we can do, you know, simple things like you know, uh, you know, take all the the segue enhancer labels and only do our motif search there. That's a relatively unsophisticated way of dealing with this data. And we better to have methods that incorporate it more directly. And finally, you know, there's ongoing interest in transitioning away from these matrices that assume independence at every position. And this was your question at the very beginning. We're finally back to it. Moving towards things like Markov models, like energy models that can assume some in <coughs> interdependence between positions. Um, I've seen recently some Kamer models where instead of, you know, having a, a parameter for every position and base combination, you just enumerate every possible kamer and have a parameter for each one of those kamers. And if you can collect enough data from something like protein binding microarrays, that works fine. And if you have limited data because you're using something like ChIP-seq, it works, it works less well. So I think that, that, that'll help a little, but probably you know, an integration of things like open chromatin data is, is, is more important. <coughs> You know, and finally, there's, you know, there's still a lot of complexity that we need to incorporate. And I think, you know, one of the biggest areas of, 
of research and understanding gene regulation over the next few years is going to be the fact that the genome is three-dimensional. We keep seeing more and more high C data. Uh, people may have seen two weeks ago that incredible single cell high C um, data method uh, where, where someone got a complete model of, of where every um, well, not every base, but you know every region of the genome was in three dimensions in one particular nucleus. Um, you know, and this people are starting to get better understandings of how the three D architecture of the genome changes from cell type to cell type within the development of some particular organism. And that's going to become very important, especially in reducing the futility of trying to figure out exactly how transcription <laughs> factor binding motifs uh, drive differential transcription and gene expression. So I'll just leave you with a, a few reflections. So, you know, I mentioned the futility conjecture. Again, uh, these models work very well in vitro. They work very well in vivo under defined conditions. But, you know, you, you can't just do a scan of a motif you've identified genome-wide and expect, expect to come up with useful results. So if you want to come up with useful results, you need to add additional information. So one thing people can add is they can make the search taste smaller by, say, identifying co-regulated genes using some other method. Another thing you can do is by, you know, focusing to regions of open chromatin within some cell type. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> if you do have that sort of smaller search space to start with, this can be a very effective way of figuring out what transcription factors might be driving the, the activity you've identified. Um, and you be very careful how you do it. So in the lab, Veronique will show you how, to, how you can use Iregulon to accomplish some of these things. Uh, and for now, I'll open up to any final questions.